Hello friends, welcome to Shankar IAS Daily Newspaper Analysis. Today's date is 22-4-2024. Displayed here are the list of articles that we are about to discuss today. So, without much delay, let's get started. Look at our first question from 2022 Pilums. Consider the following. Arogya Setu, Kovin, DigiLocker, Diksha. Which of the above are built on the top of open source digital platforms? 1 and 2 only, 2, 3 and 4 only, 1, 3 and 4 only, 1, 2, 3, 4. Here we have to understand that. Closed source software has the source code that only the person, team or organization who created it and maintains exclusive control over it. But the open source software is a software where the source code that anyone can inspect, modify and enhance. With this understanding, let's now understand the services mentioned as options above, one by one. First one is Arogya Setu. This contact tracing app was developed by National Informatics Center under Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. The source code for the Android version of the application is available for review and collaboration and the iOS version was also released as open source. The second one is Covin. Owned by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Covin was developed using open source software. The platform's open and interoperable architecture allows third-party application developers to link its API into their own platform. Third one is DigiLocker. This digitalization service is provided by Indian Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology under its Digital India initiative. DigiLocker is based on the open source platforms including PHP, Python and Node.js. The last option is Diksha. This is the national digital infrastructure for teachers and it is built on a free open source platform Sunbird. With this, let's move to the next question. With reference to Indian economy, consider the following statements. An increase in the nominal effective exchange rate, that is NEER, indicates the appreciation of rupee. An increase in the real effective exchange rate, REER, indicates an improvement in the trade competitiveness. An increasing trend in domestic inflation relative to the inflation in the other countries is likely to cause an increasing divergence between NEER and REER. Which of the above statements are correct? 1 and 2 only, 2 and 3 only, 1 and 3 only, 1, 2 and 3. Before answering this question, let us see the basics of them. C. Nominal Effective Exchange Rate NEER and the Real Effective Exchange Rate that is REER are used as indicators for external competitiveness of a country. NER is a weighted average of country's currency related to a basket of foreign currency. It measures the value of country's currency against those of its major trading partners, taking into account exchange rates and the trade weights. C. NER is calculated without adjusting for inflation or any other factors affecting the purchasing power. Whereas, real effective exchange rate, that is REER, is similar to NER but adjusted for inflation or the differences in the price level between the countries. It reflects the relative value of country's currency after accounting for the differences in the price level, making it more accurate measure of competitiveness. REER is calculated by dividing the NER by a price index or inflation factor. In essence, NEER provides a measure of country's currency value against a basket of currency whereas REER adjusts its measure to reflect the differences in the price level providing a more comprehensive view of country's currency competitiveness. Now, let's look at the first statement. NER is a weighted average of bilateral nominal exchange rates of a home currency in terms of foreign currency. So, an increase in the nominal effective exchange rate indicates appreciation of rupee. So, statement 1 is correct. Now coming on to the second statement, C. We know that REER is the weighted average of nominal exchange rate adjusted for the relative price difference between the domestic and the foreign countries. An increase in the nation's REER is an indicator that it exports are becoming more expensive and it imports are becoming cheaper, means that it is losing its trade competitiveness. So statement 2 is incorrect. Looking at the third statement, a real effective exchange rate, REER, is the NEER adjusted by the relative prices or the cost, typically captured in inflation differentials between the home economy and the trading partners. A nation's nominal effective exchange rate, that is NEER, when adjusted for inflation in the home country, equals its real effective exchange rate, REER. Higher the inflation, higher will be the divergence. Hence, statement 3 is correct. So the correct option is option C. 1 and 3 only. With this, let's move on to our daily newspaper analysis. Look at this news article. It tells us a shocking fact that Nestle baby food products which are sold in India 
Africa and Latin American countries have higher sugar content, whereas the same products sold in European markets, according to the report released by Swiss NGO. This has created shockwaves, and Indian regulator FSSA replied that it will look into the report. This is the crux of the article. In this background, let us quickly go through FSSA, its function, and its composition. C. The Food Safety and Standard Authority of India is an autonomous statutory body. It was established under Food Safety and Standard Act 2006. The main aim of the body is to regulate the manufacture, storage, distribution, sale and the import of food articles in the country. Note that it will also establish standards to ensure food safety in India. C. FSS Act 2006 consolidated various acts and orders that had earlier handled food-related issues in various ministries and departments. All these were repealed after the commencement of the Act in 2006. FSS AI functions under Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Its headquarters is in Delhi. The authority also has six regional offices located in Delhi, Gauhati, Mumbai, Kolkata, Cochin and Chennai. Talking about its composition, see, the FSSA comprises of chairman and 22 members, out of which one third ought to be the women. The chairman of FSSA is appointed by the central government and is assisted by a scientific committee and the panel in setting standards and the central advisory committee. This is to coordinate with the enforcement agency. The primary responsibility of enforcement is largely with the state food safety commissioners. Now, talking about its function, firstly, it frames regulations to lay down the standards and the guidelines of food safety. Then, it grants FSSA food safety license and certification for food businesses. Third, it lays down procedure and guidelines for laboratories in food business. Then, it provides suggestion to the government in framing the policies. Fifthly, it collects data regarding contaminants in food products identification of emerging risk and introduction of rapid alert system. Then it creates an information network across the country about food safety. Lastly, it promotes general awareness about food safety and food standards. That's all about this article. With this, let's move to our next discussion. Look at this article. IMD warns of hotter summer and prolonged heat waves from April to June, increasing water stress in India. Our usual response to crises like water shortages in Bengaluru is short-term and reactive, focusing on disaster relief. We need to shift from panic reactions to understanding and addressing the long-term chronic nature of these risks. Climate action shouldn't be limited to specific sectors or business. It requires collective effort. Environmental sustainability goes beyond occasional tree planning events. It demands sustained and comprehensive action. This is the crux of this article. We shall discuss a main question related to this topic in our usual answer writing approach. Before getting into the discussion, let us look into the syllabus. In mains, it comes under GS Paper 1. Now let's start the discussion. Look at this question. Discuss the concept of water stress in India. How do the reasons for water stress vary across different regions of the country? Suggest measures to mitigate water stress in India. See, this is a straightforward question. It asks us to explain the concept of water stress in India. Then we have to mention the reasons for varying water stress across different regions. And finally, we have to list out the measures needed to mitigate water stress. So let's start with the intro. Water stress remains a pressing issue in India, exacerbated by population growth, urbanization, industrialization and climate change. The concept of water stress reflects the imbalance between water availability and demand, posing significant challenges to sustainable development. In India, the reasons for water stress vary across different regions due to geographical, climatic and socio-economic factors. And water stress is a situation where the demand of water exceeds the available amount or when poor quality restricts its use. It is measured by the ratio of water demand to renewable supply. A country facing extreme water stress means it is using at least 80% of its available supply. Now moving on to see the body part of answer. Our subheading can be regional dynamics of water stress. First, let's see about Northern India. Geographically, Northern India faces water stress due to Himalayan origin rivers being seasonal and dependent on snowmelt. Secondly, rapid urbanization and agricultural intensification have led to groundwater depletion, particularly in states like Punjab and Haryana. Then the interstate disputes over river water sharing exacerbates water stress, as seen in the conflicts between Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan over the waters of Satlaj Yamuna Link Canal. Now we shall move on to see the western part of India. See, regions like Gujarat and Rajasthan experience water stress due to low rainfall and arid condition, and also the over reliance on groundwater extraction for agriculture and industrial purposes has led to depletion of aquifers. In addition to this, urbanization and industrialization further strain water resources, particularly in cities like Ahmedabad and Jaipur. 
Now let's move on to the eastern part of India. Despite abundant rainfall, states like Bihar and Jharkhand face water stress due to poor water management policies. Inefficient irrigation system coupled with deforestation and soil erosion contribute to water scarcity here. In addition to this, pollution of rivers like Ganges and Brahmaputra exacerbates the problem, affecting both water quality and availability. Now we shall see about the mitigation strategies. Firstly, Integrator Water Resource Management IWRM. Implementing IWRM approaches to optimize water allocation considering the competing demands from agriculture, industries and domestic sectors. Promoting rainwater harvesting and watershed management to enhance water availability and recharge groundwater. Secondly, efficient irrigation techniques. We should promote drip irrigation and sprinkler system to minimize water wastage in agriculture. Encouraging the adoption of water efficient crops and cropping pattern suited to regional climatic conditions. Thirdly, regulations and governance. Strengthening regulatory frameworks to monitor and control groundwater extraction including implementation of water pricing mechanism. Enhancing interstate water sharing agreements through dialogue and cooperation to mitigate conflicts and ensure equitable distribution. Fourthly, sustainable urban water management. Investing in the decentralized wastewater treatment plants and recycling facilities to reduce the strain on the freshwater resources. Implementing water conservation measures in urban areas including public awareness campaign and incentives for water sharing technologies. Lastly, climate change adaptation. Developing climate resilient water infrastructure and diversifying water resources to mitigate the impacts of climate change on water availability. Promoting afforestation and land use planning to conserve watersheds and maintain ecological balance. With this, let's move on to see the conclusion part. Addressing water stress in India requires a multi-faced approach tailored to the specific challenge faced by different regions. By adopting integrated water management strategies, promoting efficient irrigation techniques, enhancing governance mechanism and prioritizing climate change adaptation, India can mitigate water stress and ensure sustainable water security for its growing population. That's all about this article. With this, let's move to our next discussion. Look at this live mint article from 19th April. It states that India's 150 major reservoirs or only 31% filled due to less rainfall which was influenced by El Nino weather pattern. This has led to significant water shortages particularly in the southern states like Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka. Know that rainfall has been 18% below normal across the country since March. This increased the concerns about the water scarcity and higher temperatures in the coming month. This is the crux of the article. We know that few important commission have been established to manage water distribution in India. So let's revise them one by one. First one is Central Water Commission that is CWC. See CWC is a key technical organization focused on the management of water resources in India. It operates under Ministry of Jal Shakti specifically within the Department of Water Resource, River Development and Ganga Regeneration. The main role of CWC involves coordinating with the state government to develop strategies for controlling, conserving and utilizing water resources across the nation. This includes a wide range of activity such as flood control, irrigation, navigation, drinking water supply and water power development. Additionally, CWC is responsible for investigating construction and execution of related projects as and when needed. It is headed by a chairman with the status of ex-official secretary of government of India. The next important body is National Water Development Agency that is NWDA. See, NWDA was established in 1982 as an autonomous society under the Society Registration Act 1860. It functions under the Department of Water Resources, River Development and Ganga Regeneration, which is a part of Ministry of Jal Shakti. The main goal of NWDA is to conduct detailed studies and investigation to assess the feasibility of linking river systems, both in peninsular and Himalayan regions, as a part of National Perspective Plan for the Water Resource Development. See, NWDA's key activities include Firstly, surveying potential reservoir sites and planning interconnections of rivers. Secondly, preparing detailed report that is pre-feasibility report, feasibility report and detailed project report on river linking projects. Thirdly, implementing, constructing or overseeing the construction projects related to the water resource management. Fourthly, transferring excess water from a river basin to other, ensuring the needs of the originating basins are met. Overall, NWDA plays a crucial role in planning and managing India's water resource to prevent shortages and promote efficient use across the states. Next is Central Groundwater Authority that is CGWA. CGWA is tasked with regulating and managing country's groundwater resources. This authority has been constituted under the Section 3 of Environmental Protection Act in 1997. Its main responsibility includes ensuring the groundwater is used sustainably 
preventing its over exploitation and protecting it from pollution. The CGWA issues guidelines and permission for drilling wells and extracting groundwater, especially in the areas where the water levels are critically low. Know that Central Groundwater Authority has also framed revised guidelines for the grant of NOC for the groundwater abstraction by the industries or the projects in the country. In March 2024, the National Green Tribunal, that is NGT, expressed dissatisfaction over the Central Groundwater Authority's response to a widespread issue of toxic arsenic and fluoride in the groundwater across India. So these are the different water-related organizations and their function. So that's all about this discussion. With this, let's move on to the next. Look at this explained article from Indian Express. It discusses about the fourth global mass coral bleaching event which was triggered by the rising ocean temperature. It warns such bleaching would have severe consequences on marine life and human communities which reliant on the coral reefs. As we all know, corals are the sessile animals which are crucial for marine ecosystem and provides economic benefits. The coral bleaching caused by stress-induced expulsion of symbiotic algae threatens the survival of corals and has become more frequent due to the climate change. At last, this article calls for an urgent need to mitigate climate change to safeguard coral reefs and their invaluable ecological and economic contribution. This is the crux of the article. In this backdrop, let us discuss about corals, its bleaching and various steps to address it. Firstly, what are corals? See, corals are the skeletons of the tiny marine animals called polyps. They flourish in the shallow, mud-free and warm waters. Most of the time, corals remain in the symbiotic relationship with a single-celled photosynthetic algae called zooxanthellae. In this relationship, zooxanthellae performs photosynthesis and generates energy. Subsequently, it is used by the corals for growth, reproduction and the construction of their calcium carbonate skeletons. The pigments in the zooxanthellae also give corals their vibrant colors. In return, the coral polyps provide a protected environment for zooxanthellae to thrive and the waste products like nitrogen and phosphorus released by the corals are used as nutrients by the algae. Moving forward, corals have also have the ability to secrete calcium carbonate through the process known as biomineralization. This leads to the formation of their hard external skeleton which provides support and protection for the soft coral polyps. The skeletons are composed primarily of aragonite or calcite, two crystal forms of calcium carbonate. Over time, as coral colonies grow and reproduce, the accumulation of calcium carbonate skeleton forms a vast underwater structure known as coral reefs. This is the basics of coral. Now with this, let us move to understand what is coral bleaching. See, as I have already said, coral share a symbiotic relationship with a single-celled algae called zooxanthellae. When exposed to a condition like heat stress, pollution or high levels of ocean acidity, the zooxanthellae start producing reactive oxygen. This is not beneficial to the corals. So the corals kick out the color-giving algae from their polyps, thus exposing their pale white exoskeleton and this leads to coral starvation as a coral cannot produce their own food. See, these bleached corals can survive depending on the level of bleaching. Also, it depends on the recovery of sea temperature to normal levels. And also know that severe bleaching and prolonged stress in the external environment can lead to coral death. See, when you take the condition over the last couple of decades, climate change induced rise in temperature has made sea warmer than usual. Even when you take UN assessment in 2021, it states that world is going to experience heating of about 1.5 degrees Celsius in the next decade. As this temperature increases, the breaching becomes more frequent and the recovery becomes lesser. That's all about this discussion. In addition to the above articles we have discussed today, there are two more important articles that we need to focus upon. One is NAFED to sell Bharat brand rice in 5 kg and 10 kg packs soon. This came in the Hindu news article in Chennai edition, page number 2. With respect to this article, we have to understand the basics of NAFED first. See, NAFED, that is National Agricultural Cooperative Marketing Federation of India, was established in 1958. It is registered under the Multi-State Cooperative Society Act. It was set up with the objective to promote cooperative marketing of agricultural produce to benefit the farmers. Agricultural farmers are the main members of NAFED. That's all about this article. And the next article is the challenge of renewable energy. This came in the Hindu newspaper, Chennai edition, page number 11. With respect to this, we have to focus upon India's power sector and energy mix-up. See, India is the third largest producer and consumer of electricity worldwide, with an installed power capacity of 411.64 gigawatts as of Jan 31, 
2023. India's installed renewable energy capacity, including hydroelectric power, stood at 168.4 gigawatts, representing 40.9% of the overall installed power capacity. C. Solar energy is estimated to contribute 63.3 gigawatts, followed by 41.9 gigawatts of wind power and 10.2 gigawatts from biomass and 4.92 gigawatts from small hydropower and 0.52 from the waste to energy and 46.85 gigawatts from hydropower. As of March 2023, India has a total thermal installed capacity of about 237.2 gigawatts, of which 57.7% of the thermal power is obtained from coal and the rest from lignite, diesel and gas. The private sector in the power industry in India generates around 50.5% of country's power, whereas state and the centre generate 24% and 25.4% respectively. With this, let's move to today's prelims practice questions. Look at the first question. Biorack technology is talked about in which one of the following situation? Option A. Restoration of damaged coral reefs. Option B. Development of building materials using plant residues. Option C. Identification of areas for exploration or extraction of shale gas. Option D. Providing salt licks for wild animals in forest or protected areas. And the correct answer is Option A. Restoration of damaged coral reefs. Now look at the second question. Consider the following statement with reference to Food Safety and Standard Authority of India that is FSSAI. Statement 1. The chairperson of FSSAI is appointed by central government. Statement 2. The FSSAI is under the charge of Director General of Health Services in the Union Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Statement 3. One third of the members of FSSAI must be women. Which of the following statements are correct? One only, only two, all the three, none. The correct answer is option C, all the three. Behind me is the today's mains practice question. Interested candidates can write it in the comment section below. If you like this video, Please do share and subscribe. Thank you.